Welcome to I Think I Can podcast. My name is Luella Young. I am a woman who believes that we, like wine, get better with age. Age brings us wisdom, intuition, and a level of sophistication that is beyond the reach of youth. I am here to tell you that living a luxuriously rich and fulfilling life is in your reach. I think I can podcast will teach you to think differently in order to get different results. Allow me to show you how to do life effortlessly. This podcast is for the woman who is tired of playing by the rules of society, community, religion, parents, and partners. I think I can is all about becoming brave, authentic, purposeful, and strong. Listen weekly and you will find yourself living a life you could have only once dreamed of. Thoughts drive our physiology. So channel your thoughts with me into a life truly worth living. Enjoy the show. Hello, a quick note before we begin today's episode. I wanted to let you know about a mastermind that I am hosting for 15 women and it begins March 13th and it will run for five weeks. We will meet once a week on Zoom and you will receive some hot seat coaching from me um, with, you know, any issues that you may have come up for you that week or in in your life whatever you wish it's um i wanted to keep it intimate so only allowing 15 women to come in and it's just something that i felt the need to do now if you're wondering if there's a theme not really but if i were to pick anything that comes to my mind in terms of, you know, what these discussions are going to be about, I would say what my goal is for these women is to gain clarity around some sort of issue they're having in their life that's causing them a lot of indecisiveness. So getting clarity is I would say the big theme. Now, it could be with relationships, it could be with careers. Um, Yeah, anybody who's being challenged in this way um, will definitely benefit from this mastermind. But honestly, any topic is going to be fine. And you are also going to have access to a group chat that's going to, um, you know, be open for the five weeks where you can drop uh, a question and it will be answered either by myself or other women in the group who will be supporting you. Um, so yeah, it's I'm excited about it. it starts March 13th and just message me, get a hold of me if you have any further questions, but I would love you to join. Okay. And with that, let's begin the show. Today, I spoke with a registered psychotherapist and we talk a lot about the whole idea of connection. And when I say connection, It's not only connecting to other individuals, which of course is very important, but the whole idea of really connecting with ourselves, getting deep in our own psyche, especially when it comes to our behaviors and thought patterns that we don't easily see that stem really from the unconscious. And to do our best every day to to realize that there's a lot bubbling up from our unconscious that really takes control of our lives. Um, and we we need to be a little bit more humble when it comes to the power of, of our 
unconscious or I should say subconscious mind and um, yeah, and, and, and honor it. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Yvonne Smith Tarnas. I think it's going to be very insightful and helpful even well, especially when it comes to choosing a therapist, because that's a very important piece of connecting to another human being is is to be able to establish a deep connection with your therapist because let's face it, it's your therapist that most of us, you know, trust and have um sometimes the the courage and and um yeah the courage of opening up to and becoming vulnerable with so enjoy welcome back everyone to i think i can podcast and today i have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Yvonne Smith Tarnas. She is a licensed registered psychotherapist and a Jungian analyst. Now, what that really means is, I mean, it, it's just more about bringing spirituality and the idea of having a deeper connection into the field of psychology. It's something that, you know, maybe perhaps as a listener, you don't always think of when you're on your path of finding someone that you can connect to on a very deep level, but there it's of course, incredibly important. And we're going to be talking all about that today. So welcome Yvonne. Thank you so much, Luella. Happy to be here. Well, let's start off by explaining to our audience what exactly is a Jungian analyst and how do you how how is that incorporated into your sessions? Well, it's a it's probably I'm trying to think how to make it a simple kind mm -hmm. of explanation. Jungian analysis. Um, has kind of developed out of the early 1900s when Jung started working with Freud and then later broke off and developed his own school of thought of depth psychology. And what depth psychology carries more than the other psychologies, even those of us who go through psychotherapy training, mm -hmm. uh, depth psychology brings in this reference and regard for the unconscious. Mm. This this kind of realm of the unknown that lives in our dreams and in our the things that we say that we don't mean to say, those mm. those are kind of emissions from the unconscious. And so, Jungian psychology is particularly interested in that area because it actually has a very vital sort of purpose in our lives of actually bringing into our experience not only dreams but coincidences mm -hmm. and. Um, things like that, that wake us up, something's happening here. Mm -hmm. So from a from a psychological perspective, I work as a, like a, uh, like a most psycho psychotherapist in meeting people regularly. But with the union piece, I'm very interested in dreams and associations and imaginings that happen for my patients and how those are aspects of their own evolving self. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, again, it's n like, it's nothing. Well, I mean, of course, when someone tries to find a therapist to speak to that, you know, that they can share their deepest, darkest secrets, when you think about it, it's, it's, it's so important. And I think this is, you know, why I wanted to have you on today. Not, not only about, it's not only about talking about spirituality, it's about making those connections with, you know, between the, the client and the therapist um, that we, we, we shouldn't ignore. In other words, you found this therapist for a reason. And it, it, it's not just coincidence that yeah. you have, you know, like this sort of like an instant connection, I, I would say. Um, and it's, 
it's our role as a therapist to make the client feel very comfortable um, and to share that that connection with one another. Um, maybe you can sort of give an example that you have re- recently had or in your past years of working with some of your, your clients where this might make a little bit more sense uh, to those that are not quite understanding what we're talking about yet. Yeah, I think, Luella, you're kind of leaning into my work with synchronicities, mm-hmm. perhaps, and mm-hmm. um, our meaningful coincidences, as some people might feel more resonant with what they they know. Often, what what we've, we've found in the research is that there's a lot of mutuality in um, the clinical experience. And what I mean by that is often patients unknowingly will connect with a therapist that has had a similar issue or concern that um, they themselves had. Mm -hmm. And this is is sort of known off that, that this happens. But in my research work that I did for dissertation back in 2013, mm-hmm. I did a, um, a broad study with over uh, 70 therapeutic couples, and then pulled it down to 30 that went into my dissertation, that explored the experience of uh, meaningful coincidences that happened in the initial hours of therapy, where these, these moments, part of why the initial hours are so significant is that we carry kind of a hopeful excitement for this mm. person we're about to meet as a patient. You know, you think, oh, I've got this issue and we're going to finally find a way to work with it. There's a lot of hope in the in the experience and kind of a constellation of um, phenomena will come about in that first session around, you know, kind of finding out that there's similarities perhaps in the biographical details of the past, you know, for example, um, one of the stories, I think I shared this with uh, Bernie Beitman. I had a person come in, well, they had shown up yet. It was, it was about 10 minutes late. And I uh, started thinking about my brother who is, um, He's disabled in another state in a in a home that takes care of him. He's handicapped. And I was thinking about how much of my life had been about sort of being the functional child in my family and how much effort had gone into that, both positively, you know, for my own growth, but also just in terms of what that did to my own psyche of having to be like the hero, heroine in my family. Mm. In walks this patient, finally she's late, and she sits down and begins talking to me about growing up, how she had to be so perfect in her family. And as I press her for a little more detail, she begins telling me that she grew up with a, with a, with a sister who had a disability that made them unable to walk, who was in another state that was in a hospital. Now this, I, there's no way we would have known this, and suddenly we were right in the thick of this experience of having to be the heroic child in the family. And without any work on my part, I was able to align with her and we began the work that would end up being about six years long to deal with wow. this issue. Wow. And, and in my, many ways, you know, as a clinician, you probably relate to this, Luella. My work was also being processed in this. So it's this happened. And when I did the research with these, um, gosh, all of the different therapeutic couples, the same kind of experiences were happening with them as well. There were parallel and the biographical um, qualities of each, the patient and the therapist. There were also uh, dream images that both the therapist and patient would have that were similar or sometimes exactly the same. And then in the therapeutic sessions, there would be sort of uh, a quality of the therapist thinking about something and the patient saying it, this would happen repeatedly. So these synchronistic kind of occurrences describe what um, the unions call the the, the mutual field. Hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, I can, I can totally relate to that, but let's expand a little bit. What is the union field? The union field? Mm-hmm. Of the, the union 
mutual field or the union field psychologically? No, um, I, I think I thought what, what you were getting at there, maybe that of, you know, the whole idea of a universal mind or, you know, psychosphere or something right. like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah. The union perspective perceives uh, that we share kind of um, an overlap with the what, what Jung called the self. Mm-hmm. And we each have a, a, a self and then there's this larger self that we all kind of collaborate in, in, in being a part of. And in many ways, that aspect of our being is often in mutual space with other people. You know, it's mm-hmm. part of, you know, the sense of oneness with a group and so on. So th- this is also how we might connect on a sort of unconscious level as well as in, in both, you know, in a partnership or in a therapeutic relationship or in a group. We have this unconscious field that we're all participating in. Mm-hmm. And so this is where, you know, the sense of one another's thoughts and feelings might come in or impressions, depending on how we receive each other in different ways. But we're always in a shared field. Mm-hmm. It's learning how to part of what union training does is learning how to become attuned to what's in the field for the couple, the therapeutic couple to be present for. So, so how would one develop that better then? Um, and I'm trying to think about, you know, my listeners here, um, like, and, and, and I think we mentioned when we were talking before it's, it's a little bit overwhelming to find like the whole idea of, of finding a therapist. Uh, like I said, someone that, you know, p- potentially you can tell things that you haven't even told your own sp- you know, spouse or, or family member, right. I mean, it's, or a girlfriend or a boy you know, well, that deep. So what, what is something that we could, we could tell the listeners then maybe about, when you're searching for that person, um, just like, it's almost like finding a partnership, I know, um, out there too, I think, in in a sense, it's sort of, when you meet that person, you're, you're sort of searching for that, that deeper connection, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in that case, the the seeking uh, a professional to work with, I find that you one when I advise someone in in this process, I say meet more than one person mm-hmm. if you can. Mm-hmm. And now most of us, many of us, I should say, I don't know about most of us, I shouldn't say that, um, are online. But mm-hmm. if you're in person, it's going to be even more effective just because you have a kind of um, body sense of the connection. And it, it's going to come down to, do you feel comfortable? Is there something about that person that gives you a sense of ease with being able to be with your thoughts and feelings? Perhaps you kind of like something about them, the way their office is set up or the artwork mm-hmm. on, you know, in the mm-hmm. room. It, it's just paying attention to what kind of both of, draws you in and also what makes you feel a little uncomfortable. Sometimes right. the discomforts can be helpful too, but it's it's really like you're saying, well, it's it's can I talk to this person? Do I feel like they can receive some of what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Are they listening? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everything. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah, body language. It's um yeah, just that sense of feeling, you know, kind of at home or at ease or very comfortable. It's easy to talk to you, um, that sort of thing. Yeah. But I, I think what you're saying is that it's it's um it, it goes beyond what most of us even think of. Like there's a deeper unconscious sort of connection that we should be aware of and, and to not ignore that. Like, I mean, you know, well, I was going to say ironically, but actually it's not ironically, like, you know, just prior to uh, you and I getting on here, um, I was sort of thinking about, uh, you know, there's a cookbook that I really l- l- was thinking, you know, I might get that for my, my mom or, or my, my sister as well. Like I, I really like that. Uh, and it's just coming out and then an email pops up. It's sort of like, okay, you know, the launch is happening this week. And it, and it's that, that p- particular cookbook that, you know, is, is sort of like, 
this email just comes in and I'm just like, okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's a meaningful coincidence. You know, it's, it's, and there's so many things like that in life, but, but it's, it's just more, you know, us developing and paying attention to that, that it, there's, there's like something deeper, like there's, where it's not just our physical body, it's, um, you know, we're much deeper than that. And there is a sense of energy um, mm-hmm. within us all that that's, that is what the connecting is, is that field of energy. Um, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I, and I, you, you know, your point about, you know, finding this, this thing pop up about this cookbook release that, you know, think about, for all the listeners out there, how many times you think about somebody and then you look at your phone and there's a message from them. Mm-hmm. And th- this, this is basically us all connecting into the mutual field that we all exist in. We just haven't had such a uh, easy way to kind of check the responsiveness of it since, until the, the phones we have. Yes. And I, you know, I hear about this all the time. Mm. That, yeah, that's, that's a good yeah, I, I I never really thought about that before. I mean, um, you know, like the fact that our phones are always with us, um, you know, how different that would have been from from years prior to this, where um, you know, there is no such thing. But well, you wouldn't be able to validate the thought you have about somebody wondering if they're thinking about you. Now we have this phone. You think about my, you know, I think about my good friend. Gene and all of a sudden Gene send me a message about two minutes later just thinking about you and it's this kind of wonderful way you kind of go wow it's it we're really connected we're really really connected yeah we're really really connected yeah so what do you think is um like about our world right now that that's disconnecting us um from feeling this sense and and being um connected uh to one another well are you talking about luella the kind of technological piece or the the polarities of of belief and politics that we're dealing with there's a lot of disconnect yeah well okay yeah (laughs) i i think yeah let's first talk about because i don't i don't think that most people are well, f- like, first of all, like, I mean, someone listening to this, to this podcast might have never really thought of all of us being connected in, in a, such a yeah. deep sense, the way, so, so for those who have never thought about that, like you and I were, you know, um, I know you're very spiritual and, and so am I, and, uh, you know, maybe it's always been part of our, our lives, but but for others who, you know, think, oh, this is like woo woo weird stuff. It's, it's like, I, I feel that they have maybe rushed through life too much or, um, or, or just in order to feel love or connection, they've looked you know, in other ways of getting that, whether it is the text, whether it is the email, whether it is uh, validation, um, you know, that that you're a great employee. Um, Yeah, there's no need for validation, even from your partner, right? It's, 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 it's like just slowing down and, and feeling, you know, into your body and, it doesn't even have to be another person. That's the other thing. I mean, it can be nature. It it it, 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 it can star. stars, right? It's it's all of that. Yes, being deeply connected to all of that, but it's also it is it's attending to it, making making an effort to kind of be with whether it's your garden or your pet mm-hmm. or you know. If you're what whatever activity you've chosen, also a mindfulness with it is an important piece. It's not just always other people. Yeah, but in, yeah. the the depth of our experience comes 
comes into richness by our ability to be with and be really connected with rather than scattered. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, um, you know, this other factor of, of um, feeling, I think kind of that the, the deeper emotional connection is paying attention to what does draw you in emotionally into interest or excitement. Is it image? Is it sound? Is it textures? All of these things give us kind of insight to what matters to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Slowing down and bringing the awareness to that is sort of like, you know, what I, what I really strive for people to do and communicate to, to my clients is, um, is just being, being in the moment and, and, and aware that there is that you, you, and you don't necessarily, like I say, you don't necessarily need another person to feel that deep connection. It's, um, it's a deep connection with yourself. It's a deep connection with a higher source. And, and I noticed that like, um, you know, when you sent me sort of your, your, your bio, you mentioned like, you love everything Jungian, but like the symbolic, um, yeah, attitude, attitude. yeah, dreams, uh, astrology, you mentioned. So I, I have always wanted to maybe get into astrology a little bit more, but Let me like, please tell me what, how do you bring astrology into your lives and your, into your own life? Well, it came early for me, actually. I was introduced to astrology when I was 14 Hmm. and I was very um, intrigued, you know, at the time because this woman who was a neighbor lady that my mother brought me to began telling me about myself and I never had met her before. And I was really, of course, you know, at 14, you're still trying to figure yourself out. And then to have mm-hmm. somebody else kind of give you clear, clear mm-hmm. definitions, it was it was quite remarkable. So, of course, I had to get all the books and learn how to do this. And I don't know how many astrologer people are out there, but in those days, there was no computer to use. Mm-hmm. You had to basically etch that thing almost out of stone. And so from, from what I discovered through it, though, was a symbolic mapping that each person is born with. And I thought it was fascinating, you know, not to get too concrete with it, of course, but there was a way in which one through the archetypal kind of perspective, which is what the planets represent, an archetype, a symbol, um, one could kind of discern certain movements, certain certain tendencies, um, ways of understanding, not only oneself and other people, but the moment in time. And for me, at a young age, I, it helped me understand that everybody born has, has a particular mapping and a purpose. And knowing that, then one has to regard everyone in their, in their lives as having, having some necessary space to take up and needing to be respectful of that. Sometimes it's not so easy because there's differences, but there is an energetic that we all share and then we all participate in our own way in that energetic. Okay. So what, what uh, astrology sign are you? I have to ask. Oh, my sun sign is a Taurus and uh, that gives me a kind of steady reliability more or less. <laughs> okay. Did, did you, yeah. um, were you interested when you, um, maybe you have a partner, maybe you don't, but like, if you, if you do, were you sort of, is that something that you were interested in your part, like in, in finding out about your partner? Well, interestingly, he's, um, Richard Tarnas has written the book Cosmos and Psyche. He's a, he's a, a, a philosophy professor who also works with astrology so oh, okay that, yeah <laughs> I was drawn to him because he was teaching and then 10 years later we find ourselves in a in a relationship so yeah mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't look at his chart to see if we were a match no 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 well so it, you guys were definitely in the stars yes yeah. it happened on its own that's a synchronicity you know 
sometimes they happen and then you can later look at the mapping of it to see if this is a good fit. Now you could do that too in therapy. You could, if you worked with astrology in that way, mm-hmm. but um, I think of astrology more as a symbol system in the same way that we might also use um, the thought of symbols or images as a way of understanding dream meaning and dream significance and Mm. so forth like for example an egg represents perhaps new life new potential Mm. you dream about an egg there's something coming in that could be new in your life something that needs to be cracked open in some way Mm. um, and and held tenderly because it's still fragile and it's neonate state so there's just different ways we think about you know the symbolic and astrology gives us one way but it's not the only way yeah, no, that, I think uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I think uh, your sign that comes up, you know, in your dream or um, a certain sign is very different for, it has a different meaning for, for, for everyone. Yes. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like, what do you, what, what meaning does it bring to you? It might have a special meaning. Maybe your mother gave you eggs every morning or something and that memory of the egg is suddenly connected to mother and, and, you know, being held and connected to a, a deeper meaning of love. So you, you have to kind of become aware of your own symbolic vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And the only way that you can do that is sort of, um, well, noticing the signs and, and like you say, sort of um, working backwards in, in a sense in, in, you know, connecting the dots. Um, oh, you know, this sign has come up quite often and it's linked to these sort of experiences that I'm having or these, this type of awareness, Um, you know, talking about dreams and I, and I'd be very interested to hear what what you have to say too. It's um, like, I, I'm just going to put this out there because I don't want to forget to ask you, but like, just in terms of writing down your dreams, I want, I want to know if, you know, if it, if you feel it is very important to maybe turn the light on, get out the pen and paper and, and write these things down. But um, I I know it can be frustrating for some people, like when it comes to a reoccurring dream and for the life of them, you know, they, they can't really understand the, the symbolism in that dream. And even myself, um, I sort of have a suspicion, but I ha- I had this recurring dream quite often of of just you know not um like being in a foreign airport or country with my family and my family leaving the country before I was and and then there was some sort of sense of you know when it was time for me to leave and get at the airport that you know, I was behind, I was rushing, I might be missing the plane. Like it was so like, I mean, I still need to unpack that, but like there's there, it was happening over and over. Um, But it could like, the only thing I can, it did stop happening. And it was when I joined like a group, um, a larger group, sort of like a, a support group. And you know, that could be it, but I think I just wanted to bring that up is, is, is don't, you know, again, our listeners don't, don't uh, like ignore those, those dreams. Yeah. Because there, there is a deeper meaning to it. So would that be something that, you know, being more of a union analyst that you, you, would have a lot of experience with like in working oh, with yes. your clients? Yes, definitely, Luella. You know, dreams like that, the recurring dreams, it's like the psyche is trying to get some information into mm-hmm. the conscious realm. Mm-hmm. So we're thinking about, you know, the way you described yours, for example, trying to get somewhere. We t- go to airports to take off to a new land. Mm. When we think about that in our life, we're trying to move from one state of being into another state of being. Mm-hmm. But there's a difficulty. There's something in the transition that's problematic. And, you know, without getting into your family history, but the family material is interesting. They leave without you. Mm-hmm. So there's something that you have to do on your own, independent mm-hmm. of them to Mm -hmm. make that trip Mm -hmm. and so 
you you somehow worked that out for yourself by joining this group that sounds like it was very supportive of you mm-hmm. created another family right mm-hmm. to make this next stage of growth yeah that's a wonderful dream example but i do think that uh you know dreams are give us a lot of insight they also sometimes um can help us understand something we're wrestling with that you know we don't even realize and and i find when i talk to my patients these days with the phone, I just tell them to kind of wake up enough to punch the 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 audio, you know, recorder so they can just record the dream into oh. by voice into their phone. And then we listen to it when they come into the session. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. You're right. so you don't yeah. have to fumble for the pencil and <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I like it because you're, you're, you know, it can be very dark and still in the room and you're still sort of in a, in a dream like state. Um, yeah. Which is also, I think is very important to, to allow that unconscious still to be, you know, yeah. Yeah, Producing what it produces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it's, 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 and I think, you know, that's what's so wonderful about, seeing a therapist is, is, is unpacking this stuff together. It's, it's getting um, a different insight, a different look into, because, you know, one of my favorite sayings is like, we don't know what we don't know. And, or, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees and, and, and nothing is more meaningful than to those phrases than when, when we're talking about you know, the unconscious and, and it's just like, it's, we, we can't see our behaviors, um, unless someone really points them out to us or these patterns. And, um, like, we think we know ourselves, but we don't, there's such a depth to us. Yes. Um, Yes. mm. Yes. And, you know, part of therapy, uh, and, the dream world as well can reflect back some of those unknown parts of ourself that we might think are so other, right? Mm-hmm. You know, that's what, and I tell my students when we're talking about the shadow, which is a um, one of the factors in Jungian psychology, we have the shadow aspect of our nature. Those are usually the things that we look at other people and go, oh, I don't like that person because they do this and this and this. And that's actually some aspect of ourself, particularly when we're, hooked into it, you know, oh, I hate this thing that this person does. Well, there's usually some of us in that. Mm -hmm. So it's very useful to kind of be curious. I use that word a lot. I use Mm -hmm. curiosity to Mm -hmm. why do I have a problem with this person or why am I having this repeat dream? You know, what is that quality of, 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 um, you know, experience that I'm having when I do a particular task that that makes me excited or pulls me into dread what is that connecting me to be curious mm-hmm. and, and not go too fast to solving it or naming it it's just let it have kind of time to amplify itself yes because yeah. we have to kind of grow into our our experiences in that way mm-hmm. yeah yeah um what like what type of client typically comes to see you then like i mean oh, yeah, what, a what, what, what what a variety okay okay it, yeah but go ahead but any 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 well, one, like you're... like kind of everything from dealing with grief to um to relationship work for example i mean do you have people coming to you saying, because I, I, I work mainly uh, as, as a relationship coach or, or, or therapist. And do you find, you know, people are trying to determine whether or not to stay or leave a relationship? Like, do you, do you have that? Oh, yes. I okay. have. <laughs> oh, yes. I have couples who are trying to figure out if they're staying together or not. I have uh, younger people who are just make, going through that launch phase. I have mm-hmm. um, aging adults on the other end of the spectrum. 
and a lot of um, executive women actually that I work with dealing with issues of uh, being in power, dealing with power, dealing with mm -hmm. the usually still the patriarchal construct of the business world and how to, to mm -hmm. function within that. Mm -hmm. um, I have stay at home mothers dealing okay. with raising children and, and getting lost in who they are and, you know, mm -hmm. wondering about their relationships, their marriage, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. We could pick any of those and talk about just the general field of it. It's, it's well, rich. Yeah. It's, it's super rich. So let's talk about, let's talk about the couples that are trying to determine whether or not, you know, they are essentially different people and maybe they've reached their expiry date or whether or not um, they should just be working harder because I, you know, I, I think yeah. that's because with the working harder comes so many other um, I would say low energy emotions, right? It's sort of the guilt, the shame, um, stigma, divorce, for example. Um, so how have you helped uh, couples through that, for example, using more of a well, union I, I use union. I also work with um, a number of different styles depending, but, you know, like yeah. um, I work with a... Um, emotionally focused therapy orientation as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, working with couples and dealing with the, the grievances that usually have built up over time, that's a hard one when, when someone comes in and everybody's got their grievance of he does, she does, or she and she does, who, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. These are these are aspects that feel unlivable to the person, yeah. both people in some way. And uh, it takes work to recognize how to listen and be present with your partner when you feel you're the injured party. But that's generally what it's taking for both to be able to listen to where the other person's at, completely connect with it, respond with empathy, and then also get that in return. And slowly what happens in my experience is but both people have to be very committed to this method. Mm. They begin to understand that what has been missing is the empathic awareness of the other mm -hmm. and a need to uh, step away from the narcissistic defense. And what I mean by that is the, the sense that they're not, I'm not getting my needs meet, met mm -hmm. and I'm done. One mm -hmm. has to be curious to why that's actually a defense that's not actually related Mm -hmm. it's it's expecting almost a child parent kind of dynamic of being approved of rather than being a partner that also has to do the work I don't know if that makes yeah, sense yeah no to you. Ab absolutely it, it's sort of like it's ego egocentric um sort of you know you must change in order for this relationship to 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 work and you know these are all the the things you're wrong about and yeah, it's it's just so it's just very divisive, and of course that's that relationship's never going to work. And um, yeah. rather than looking inside yourself and going, hmm, yeah, these these areas I can I could really work on. And like you said, you know, you sort of in, referred to before, you indicated that if something's um, not working in your world, in in terms of you know the, this relationship you have, like if you're being triggered by this other person's behavior constantly rather than just focusing on on this flaw that you see in the other person is sort of to kind of go hmm why is that triggering me you know what is it about me because yeah there's always some something about yourself that's you know in lack um that's bringing out this this anger or, the, or this trigger this this own need of yours that you're not um able to or you don't want to look at sort of thing um yeah quite often right mm -hmm. and what, that when those situations happen it's easy to imagine it's the partner's problem fault that's creating this issue it's right. very 
it has to be kind of separated and looked at. And I find that work to, I find is very rich, but it takes time. It takes time. And, yeah. com- and commitment. Yeah. 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 And, and, and commit time and commitment and like on, on a, on a, on a real, like, um, like sort of daily sort of trajectory. I mean, because I don't know if, if you find this, but I, I mean, I certainly do is, is, you know, couples coming in and having a session and then, um, you know, either thinking that it's, it's, that's it, you know, like it's one or two sessions and off they go. Um, it's, it's almost like, okay, no, we have to go home now and, and do like, what can we do daily to sort of bring our awareness to yes, our partner and, and, and compassion toward our partner, but also what can we do to do like our inner work every day? Um, and it's, it's daily, it's, it's, it's daily practice. Um, it is. Yeah. And, and, and I think what therapy does, if, 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 you know, if you're willing to make it like a, a weekly um, session, you know, you can even say like, we'll try this for X number of months or whatever. It's just making some sort of, yes, like, it's nice to say that we're going to have this commitment and we're going to work on it. But then after, but, but after you leave the therapy room, if you, if you don't, it's almost like you need this accountability partner, like just sort of like okay, this is what's going on now. Does this seem, you know, like this is a good way of doing it or, you know, oh no, like maybe let me guide you a little bit in this way. Let's try this. If you're not happy with what the outcome is, it's, it's, it's a back and forth sort of, um, yeah. Yeah. Like it doesn't, yeah. I don't know what, what you feel, but I often feel that for the relationships that never get better, it's because they feel that if they come once or twice, you know, maybe twice a year or, um, but there's a reason why you're back six months later, you know, right. Um, the, pa- the patterns, the patterns are deep. So mm-hmm. it takes a lot of attention to change the communication patterns. Mm-hmm. Our partners are very tuned into our tone our look, yes. you know, the, the, the mm-hmm. raised eyebrows and the kind of, you know, and so one has to be really uh, able to be humble in mm-hmm. the work as well as persistent, committed. And I do think, you know, at least once a week therapy for the couple for, you know, a good set of months at yes. very least is the only way to kind of change the the rhythm and the habits of, of engagement. Mm-hmm. It's really, really important. And of course, my my backup is always hold curiosity when things are getting activated. It's like, what happened here? Rather than it's your fault. Right. Like, what if, how did I bring, what did I bring into this? Being mm-hmm. curious to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Curiosity and compassion, I always say, are two C words that we... Uh, <laughs> ooh, yeah. We need to, to to be using in our, in our conversations more and yeah. more and more in in what yeah. role did i play you know and even in even entering this conversation because like you yeah. say after years and years of living with someone there's certain patterns of behavior that we've noticed and that we so we're walking into every single conversation with a certain presumption of where this conversation is going to go and we we have to drop all of that and and see it in a, in a different light yes. um yeah so well what else can we talk about in terms of um because you know y- y- analyst what what analytical skills um have you been able to incorporate into your sessions that bring like a deeper connection, let's say with, with your client um, in, in the back. Well, of, yeah. In the back and forth. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, part of being analytic is to not only notice the content of the, of the dialogue, but it's also, you know, the rhythm of it, the, mm. um, what gets brought in, um, 
on a with a frequency what is not being brought in what you know what is mm -hmm. are they coming late are they mm -hmm. showing up you know um mm -hmm. and and only you know kind of going quiet you know kind of watch the the flow and all of that from an analytic point of view we draw upon all of these different things and begin to be curious to what form it takes you know is there a withdrawing happening mm. is there a desire to please that comes in you know i show up on time i stop right on the hour without being told a good patient there's all kinds of ways that we think about this and then what's happening in the content of the dialogue is like is that reflecting some of these qualities within the person what they're talking about mm -hmm. you know i'm trying to think quickly here luella to give an example um I have a young person that I've been working with for a number of years, and they are very um, kind of young, old for their for their age. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a a, a person who is probably going to old soul. Yeah. yeah, we could say an old soul. Yeah, and they already knew uh, as a teenager what they what they probably were going to go to do, and they have begun doing this at their early twenties, and. And yet there's a lingering sense of the child in them, you know, almost like someone who's become mm. a parentified child is taking on so much, but this little girl part is still there. And so from an analytic perspective, we try to be curious to what she needs because she's still in the mix. And sometimes those that, that, that child part of us can end up running the show in ways that are not always so good for the adult part of us. Mm -hmm. So we attend to that. We can connect with it to make sure that there's a conscious place for that aspect of self. Mm. Yeah. I can see how you're saying like, there's almost two, two different personalities. Um, well, the, I think there's many different personalities in all of us, right? That's the other thing. Yeah. I think that 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 it's 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 a humbling fact, but I think it's it's important to note that that there's many different personalities dancing around in all of us. Um, and just to give an example of that, like we we have to think, you know, if you're thinking about yourself, who are you with your with your best girlfriend, you know, out at a coffee date? And then who are you at home, you know, with your teenagers and who are you in your office? And we're all different people um, in different, yeah. yeah, in different relationships and different circumstances. And that's what makes us unique and lovable. Um, you know, one is not necessarily worse than the other it's just um just noticing that and 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 nurturing each one of those personalities exactly exactly mm -hmm. as you're saying that i'm thinking in the times when we notice that the, the little the child parts taking over at a time when it's really not the right time it's it's like oh that's interesting right Right. Where's the adult self here? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the best of us comes out with the people that we're most comfortable with, um, uh, where we feel the least judgment, perhaps. You know, when I think about your best girlfriend um, who knows so much about you, everything you did when you were 12 to, you know, yeah, throughout your young 20s and everything. Um, and compared to like maybe when you have your your mom hat on and you all of a sudden you have this like, I would say like childlike behavior of, you know, wanting your way in controlling, you know, their lives. Um, yeah, you don't you don't need to do that. Um, you don't need to have control over the, situ the situation. It's it's okay to give guidance, but you know because I I do see a lot of those controlling behaviors in mothers, including myself, and we we all do it within our best intentions. Um, you know, we we yeah. we must raise these these wonderful you know children, but um, but we we often come across as wanting to control it. So yeah. 
Yeah. And, and understanding why we want to control it and how we feel our children represent aspects of our self worth and becoming in tune to that is so important. Exactly. Well, and that comes down to the partner, the friend, you know, the profession, how we kind of use those different templates as, as um, self identification and just being aware that perhaps it's a little needs to be adjusted. Right. Yeah. Things need to be a little fine tuned. And, and and I think often it's, it's the ego stepping in there, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and um, you know, it's, yeah. It, it, so um, anything else that you'd, you'd want to share with um, the listeners in terms of, of, you know, getting to the, the deeper, like what it means to be deeply connected with yourself and with, with others? Um, I would say that if you in this day-to-day experience to just notice what comes in and brings both um, a sense of connection, mm-hmm. a sense of kind of here I am, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of with myself in a way. It's very at one. And it is being able to kind of use that as a place to return to, to get balanced. Mm-hmm. I think if we can all find that spot, even if it's once a day, it might be a meditation. It might be drinking your, your espresso. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's in a really important moment of kind of being at one and kind of taking a little quick inventory before we kind of make contact with the world. Right. Ourselves. Right. Yeah. The power of awareness, I think is what you're, you're describing yes. there. Yeah. 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 And, and with that awareness of what's happening around you, you're able to notice the meaningful coincidences, the signs. Yes. Um, yes. And, and that really grounds a person, right? Because it, it, again, it makes you realize that there's, there's something greater than me. And, I think for some people, when they feel incredibly alone, it's 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 sort of a reminder you're not alone. You're so not alone. Yeah, um, you're woven into the tapestry of all things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so comforting to to view your life like that. That um, you're no better or no no worse than any other human being on this earth. And uh, yeah, the the more you're you're aware of that, like you just, I always come back to you know that saying that maybe we were all told that when we were young is that you're you're your own special little snowflake, and it's so true. There's so much beauty um, about you, and and your flaws are your flaws, but you know that's okay. Just just celebrate yourself and. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Great, great point, Luella. Mm-hmm. Celebrate yourself. Yeah. Well, going into the holiday season, that's a good way to kind of end it. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, I wish you a, a fantastic rest of your day, Yvonne. And thanks so much um, for making time uh, with with well, our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Luella. It's been a pleasure to spend time with you. And I good hello to everyone out there listening. Thanks so much. Yes. And it it was a a meaningful coincidence that we met. Definitely. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's great. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks once again for joining me on another great episode of I Think I Can podcast. If you liked it, please subscribe below so you don't miss out on any future episodes. And until next week, treat each day like it was your last because each new day is a privilege that we shan't take for granted. Cheers and have a great week. Bye-bye.